So, Brett, good to see you again. Another week, another episode. How's it going? It's going well, buddy. How you doing? Uh, not too bad. Not too bad. Um, I learned something this week. And let me tell you, right. let me see if you uh, agree. Writing's hard. Would you? Yeah, it sure is. <laughs> Writing's hard. <laughs> and um, something I learned about that is that since I've been working at UPI for about over a year now, actually, I've been here for quite, for 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 a spell, and I've been writing about you know like State Department stuff, Venezuela. China, all that kind of stuff. And if you look at the writing that I did at the beginning of my tenure here compared to now, the difference is astronomical. And the reason why that that difference is, and let me just say my writing now is better, but that is because of the, uh, what's the, I have written it down. The word is uh, the universal knowledge that you pick up, right? That like, that knowledge of the situation that gets imbued into you through having do, done it. Now, the reason why fiction is so difficult is because you have to make it up. And what I learned from doing the journalism, doing the journalism, from writing journalism, <laughs> is that, for, in terms of fiction, is that fiction, you have to build up that internal knowledge. That just doesn't exist. You have to build it up from scratch. And I think that is one of the problems that I have with when it comes to writing and why it takes me so freaking long to get even a damn short story done is because I have to go through so many drafts just to get that internal knowledge of my characters, of the setting, of what's going on, right? So, and I just thought that was kind of an interesting comparison because like when... When I was writing about Venezuela at the start, I didn't really know that much about it. I had to like learn about sure. the people. So the narrative, so the story I'm writing is just very bare bones. This is what happened. This is who did it. This is where it is. Blah, blah. The who, what, when, why, what. Compared to now, where there's more nuance in the piece. Even though I've never been to Venezuela. Even though I've never met those people. But I've seen the trajectory of their actions and what it could potentially mean and all that kind of stuff. So all that just gets imbued into the piece. And I thought that was an interesting uh, way to kind of look at editing or a way to kind of look at the fiction process is that when you start from scratch, you really need to build up an internal knowledge of all of it, which is just not there at the beginning, which is why they say, write what you know, because if you don't know, then it takes that much longer to pick it up. Mm -hmm. Thoughts? Once you learn something, too, you have to figure out what to do with it. You know, there's plenty of things that I, there's plenty of things that I know, at least in a, in a practical sense, you know, not, not exhaustively, but mm -hmm. at least functionally, that, I, that wouldn't go into a story. So even once you learn something, you have to figure out what to do with it. You know, it's right. not as if a story, a story sometimes presents itself all at once, uh, the main arc of mm -hmm. it. But you, you, as soon as you try to put it to page, you realize that it's actually, it only appeared to arrive all in one piece. There's parts that are missing. And, and that's, that's one of the many joys of writing is trying to figure out where in the interstices you can actually put little plot subplots mm. and anecdotes and um and different different colorful happenings right that that, that make the story what it is mm. think of think of pulp fiction you know which which quentin tarantino wrote as well as directed of course famously you could argue that the the scene where john travolta's character and uma thurman's character are talking about the merits of a $5 milkshake mm -hmm. it, or not, you know, is not necessarily essential to even that scene, what the mm -hmm. scene was trying to do, let alone the entire movie. Mm -hmm. And yet that's a scene that sticks out in your mind when you remember Pulp Fiction. Just a, that's a milkshake. That's, that's, was it milk and cream? Yeah. It? Milk <laughs> and ice or something like that. Milk, yeah. cream and ice. That's $5. You know, this is obviously mm -hmm. 1994 US dollars. Uh, be a lot more expensive nowadays but it's just you don't even know even even if you convince yourself that that you must learn something in order to write a story you don't even necessarily know what to do with it right and That's what does it actually of course this is this is a more highfalutin question what does it mean to know something 
What does it mean? What does it mean to know the English language? What does it mean to know English? <laughs> what does it mean? Yeah, I just encountered know? two new words yesterday when I was yeah. reading a book by Saul Bellow. Two words I had never heard of before. Yeah. And dear listeners, if you know anything about me, you know I'm an arrogant fuck. <laughs> and I think I. Think you I know, know all the good shit. words, right, Brett? All I the big words. All the good words. <laughs> so, what do you what do you mean by inner movement? Is that the word you use? The inner no, inner I, life. What do you mean by that? Well, okay. So what was the phrase you used, by the way? I apologize. I said I think it's my... wrong. I said I, I, I said universal knowledge, right? Like like it's this like for instance when when I when I talk to when you hire a sports writer. For uh -huh. a newspaper, you don't hire them necessarily because they can write. That's a bonus. You hire them for that internal knowledge they have about all the baseball, right? Uh -huh. So, like when I I'm writing a story, and there's a cop in it, and like oh well, I'm writing a story, and there's like all these like tangential characters that come in and interact with the main character. You have to have an internal knowledge about those guys. Like right. they have, they have wants, they, and you have to vo vocalize those wants without those wants being so apparent. Because, and w something I learned when it comes to, especially theater, theater, you have a character that has a want. They're going towards that want all the time, and there's obstacles preventing them from that want. And so everything they do and everything they say has to be about going towards that want. And that's how drama works, right? So you start at this, like, rather uh, generally, like, at the, the lowest point in the story. And then that, that, while they go towards that want, the drama increases with it because of the obstacles that are in the way. And the greater the obstacle, the greater the drama. So they always tell you to keep ratcheting it up, right? That's why... Um, like short stories don't always have to be that intense, but in film and in theater, there's, there's, it's always so much more intense because they need it to be dramatic. It's, it's visual. They want to see it that way. So when you have these characters in a piece that like this cop I'm working with, uh, I have to figure out who he is. I have to figure out why he acts the way he does. I need to figure out. And, it, and when you start writing the piece, you're just like, Oh, he's a cop. Oh, he gets pulled over by a cop. Well, no, he's not a cop. He is Bob, who is a cop, or whatever the guy's fucking name is, right? And so I find it that's so difficult. Also very rewarding, as you said, but also very, very frustrating. Like, building that up from scratch, right? And then mm -hmm. when, when the editing process, the thing that I found, like you compared it to, you were talking about writing is either clay uh, a sculpture that, or uh, that you build from clay or you chisel it from stone. And in many mm -hmm. ways, it's both, right? Mm -hmm. So you start with the clay and then you get something fully formed and then you need to start chiseling away from it or chiseling mm -hmm. at it. And that's mm -hmm. the part that I find really difficult. I mean, mm -hmm. you, I'm, one of the reasons why I kept thinking about this because uh, Brett recently wrote a short story and it's phenomenal. It's phenomenal that you could create such a world so well and so quickly without spending years working on it is there a way that you are able to do that it's it's thank you for calling it you know using that wonderful compliment mm -hmm. to describe it i i don't know that it's i think it's a story that i've been maybe thinking about for a long time without realizing it. Right. And, you know, I, I used to not write autobiographically. I thought it was it was boring. But then I, I realized that most of the writing that I find compelling turns out to be autobiographical to the writer of that story. So I'm like, well, mm. all right. And it feels as if I've I've lived that short story in a way where but not with the and then those the characters that are, are uh, that support the action I've, I've known people like that you right. know even if i don't even if i don't uh, know them by name or by face you know even if they aren't the same if they might composite people or something mm -hmm. like that or people that i imagine even if it's weird the more that i the more time that i spend alone thinking about people and and observing them to some degree, whether whether by talking with them and just listening, mm. which is a kind of observation and conversation, or looking at, you know, watching interviews on YouTube, watching a bunch of them, hundreds of them in a month, you know, just listening to how people talk and what they talk about. So it's, you can start to create characters that you've never met. Mm. 
that you know exist. And in a way, and again, if you if you imbue them with a certain energy, uh, whether it's a traumatic energy or a, or a violent energy or a triumphal energy, mm -hmm. there's certain traits that that are universal to people who experience those emotions, but are also individually expressed. You know, anxiety. Right. Yes. Panic attacks, that's an extreme form of, mm. of feeling you don't have control over the world around you and reacting against it. your nervous system sort of shutting down mm. or, or maybe not maybe shutting down is the wrong term, maybe overreacting, you know, to, 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 to stimuli, to external stimuli. But how would, a, how would a particular character have a panic attack? You know, would he or she blink a lot? Mm -hmm. If the skin is if the skin is pale, the throat will most likely flush very noticeably. And and uh, there was a wonderful detail um, in a book that I actually got by listening to the Joe Rogan podcast about the uh, the Comanche, the Comanches, uh, specifically their last war chief, Quanta Parker, mm -hmm. was um, the son of a Comanche chief. And a captive named uh, Cynthia Parker, Cynthia Ann Parker, a white captive. And the, his foil, well, you know how people who write historical uh, monographs or even historical larger works will try to frame the events of the past as a story so that we understand it better. A narrative. Mm -hmm. So even though it's all, even though it's all sort of historical fact with, with, with you know documentation to prove some of the what happens in it, a lot of it is rather conjectural. Yeah, and, there's, there's and artifice to it. With, artifice to it, right? So, Quanta Parker's foil in, in his mature life as a as a as a Comanche war chief is a Civil War veteran who, uh, God, I forget his name, to shame too, but he had some of his fingers blown off in a, in a battle. Mm. And when he, he it, it, it pissed him off, he was personally affronted by the fact that, that the Comanche could humiliate him out on the Llano Estacado out there in Texas, the, the, the Comancheria. That he would, that they would steal his horses at night and not engage him in battle and frustrate him at every turn. So he strove to try to understand their ways and to be better at them, at at, at their style of fighting than they were. But whenever they get the better of him, he'd get very agitated, and he'd click his stumps together. Oh. He'd and and this is eyewitness accounts of uh, his subordinates who were with him. And he'd he 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 kind of like get this very keen, angry look in his eye, like when he's as he's watching his horses getting stolen or something, or seeing Comanche ride upon his troop in an ambush. He'd he'd start to snap his stumps together, almost like you know, like when you yeah. click your fingers, except it's stumps. He'd like rub them together, the tips. Of, uh. Yeah, and they'd make thumpy noises. They made mm -hmm. they'd make flesh bone noises, mm -hmm. you know, because they're all swollen and whatever from the heat. I'm sure too. So, all right, so this is what I mean about taking these universal human energies, if you will, these, these, these overarching emotions, these overpowering emotions, but, but seeing them expressed individually, mm -hmm. you know, can understand the captain's frustration. Right. But one thing we didn't see coming was how he expressed it. And you can have fun with that when you're writing a short story. You can mm -hmm. have fun with it. It's, it's, in fact, details like that I find to be almost more compelling than I mean how many love stories have you read you know how many how many how many tales of thwarted ambition have mm. you read about how yeah. many how many 1990s style you know I'm affluent and I rue myself for it you know mm. stories but it's the individual details it's 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 it, you know it's it's Old man Karamazov kissing the front the front of his hand, kissing the palm of his hand as he's telling his sons an account of his his brutal depravity. Yeah, I think um, what's it called? Vonnegut wrote uh, his thesis 
on like there's only like a certain amount of stories that you can that we've ever actually written. It was like a oh, handful of different right a handful. No. Not many. Uh-huh. But that's incredible. Just like, you know, the amount of when you think about it, human beings share most of their genetic code with one another. Mm. It's only about one percent variance in my genes and yours. But yeah. think of the extraordinary uh, diversity. That's that, a lovely that, way to say it. Hmm? That's a lovely way to say that, Brett. Yeah. Oh, it's not. Yeah, thank you. Um, I didn't come up with that percentage. It was, it was, <laughs> <laughs> you mean you didn't? You went? You didn't lab away in some like room somewhere <laughs> to and figure out the percentage of that we all have? It's, <laughs> I didn't do. I didn't look it up myself. <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's a troubling thing though where i i hear somebody i trust for no better reason than perhaps i like you know the way he or she looks or I like mm-hmm. their diction or I like the podcast that they're on oh i trust that person mm-hmm. and then they say something and mm-hmm. i just parrot it I don't, right i don't well that, see, i have done mm-hmm. no research in my life think about that no but it feels I've like you do no research peer reviewed i put forward no mm-hmm. peer reviewed propositions mm-hmm that I've done original research on ever in my life. And I purport to know things. The, f- the effrontery of it. Well, that, that's the problem I had with Joe Rogan when we talked about Joe Rogan before, right? And he just has these people on parody, whatever. And I said that there's a responsibility to like, when you have millions and millions of viewers to kind of know what, like to hold people accountable and to, talk, to hold them at check because you are just disseminating that information, which could be wrong could be dangerous and it's dangerous i mean we have like a a a lovely passionate viewership and listenership but it pales in comparison to other people out there so if we say something that's incorrect we will be hurting our viewership but it doesn't have the same effect as you know saying something like on a big program that uh wearing masks are causing yeah it was it was john stewart for years as much as i love him Mm. saying you know why do you take us seriously this is a comedy show Mm. you know tonight uh the the show that he did that's very responsible it's very responsible you know it's just it's just it's just uh, you can you can i i just don't think people like john stewart and joe rogan know what to do with their responsibility you know they might have with joe rogan his podcast started off as him talking shit Mm. with his close friends and with John Stewart, it did actually start off as a as a comedic, irreverent look at 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 the yeah. bloviating outlets and so he forth. He wears a tie. But he mimes them. More. What was that? He mimes them, right? He's he's mirroring them, like he's wearing a suit behind a desk and does interviews. He, he mimes. He mirrors news. But sorry, I didn't. I interrupted you. No, not at all. No, it's just uh, you know the, the shows grew into something that neither of them. You know, mm. knew what to do. It's like, all right, all of a sudden, and again, this probably wouldn't have happened if 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 news outlets like CNN and Fox News weren't wholly beholden to powerful interests and mm. told the sorts of truths that were only convenient to them rather than to the mass of mm-hmm. of human beings who watch the news and actually think that it's a faithful account of what's happening in the halls of power. Mm-hmm. You know, if 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 they hadn't betrayed their mandate, then we wouldn't need people like. We wouldn't need alternate sources of information. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, you know, I mean, Joe Rogan, his influence is extraordinary. Extraordinary. I, I, I don't, and I think maybe he's loath to admit that he has a responsibility to his viewers to, to not, to not, I mean, but here's the thing. Part of the charm of that show is him just saying any fucking thing that comes to his head, <laughs> whether it's factual or not. Uh-huh. That's part of the charm of the show. He's a very good ad lib. Uh-huh. He's a very good, impre- he's a very good improvisational comedian. Some of his shit is wildly funny on that show, and he just spits it out like mm. it just just comes often in the form of a question. <laughs> ever, ever, what happens? What happens if you know? If in order for you to get the the antidote, you had to get fucked in the ass by your best friend. <laughs> you know, just absurd shit. No, what if you what if you could what if the disease 
was it you like he was talking about some illness i think it was covid-19 and how 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 silly it would be if the cure was discovered by a man who practiced bestiality <laughs> and he fucked a dog mm -hmm. and by 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 basically getting the culture from the from yeah. the dog ass he found the immunity to COVID-19 and then, and then he upped the ante and said, what happens if you had to fuck just that dog to get immune? Like it was just that dog. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? It's silly. It's absurd. But meanwhile, yeah. he's speaking about something that has hundreds of millions, if not billions of people in a very tense state of mind all day long, every day, mm -hmm. you know? So is it, is it, however, well, I, I think that that's a little I bit different that, because obviously that's hypothetical and not not a real situation. No, of course not. <laughs> maybe making light of it is is good for people in a way. Maybe uh, maybe just for their for their momentary. Very mood. much. I think so. I, like, how have you been under the COVID like oppression? See, I I almost don't think my response would be very interesting. I'd much rather ask you, which I I will in a moment. But mm -hmm. because I don't, I'm I'm a bachelor. And I will never Ladies, have children. Bachelor. No, I don't. <laughs> no, it's just I, I, I've, I've been single for so long now. I really enjoy it. Mm. And, but I, I don't. My, my, uh, this is, this is all that I am mm -hmm. responsible for. For those of you just listening, I'm just pointing at my dumb body. Um, this is all I'm responsible for. So, in a way, I'm in a. I'm at a level of of stimulus. I'm at a level of uh, tension mm. every day that resembles uh, COVID, you know? So mm. because I'm only responsible for myself. So if I get behind the wheel of a car, I know how dangerous it is driving, especially around Boston. <laughs> and so coronavirus is just something else like that I have to mm -hmm. worry about. But, you know, for yourself, you, you have, you're married. You have a lovely wife, and you have a you have a, a fun loving, cute kid, and a dog. You know, Don't forget the dog. And a dog. Well, yeah. that dog. No offense, <laughs> that dog guys. Are, well, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I have nothing against. <laughs> you, We're trying. To <laughs> you owe him five bucks, man. He might have something against you. You owe him five bucks. <laughs> You're right. You're right. But how are you taking it? Oh, it's I mean, been Korea. Uh -huh. Korea has handled the crisis better than most. Yeah. As a country. Well, especially on Jeju, we've had 20 cases or 25 cases now, right? We, we, we have had so few cases that it's been relatively, uh, life has been relatively normal. I mean, I, I was wearing a mask for a while. We're not really wearing them so much now. I mean, but I, I live at home. I mean, most people live at home, but I live and work at home, right? I don't go out very much. Um, I, I can go days without going outside. So... I don't really have to wear a mask unless I'm going somewhere, which I don't do. Um, but the thing, it's been really depressing. I mentioned it a little bit last time. It's depressing in that, um, and I've never experienced this before as a, as a journalist, is that I spend all day writing about this stuff. Yeah. And then I, I, I deal with it in my personal life too at home, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's constant. And so, like... And this year has been really difficult in that regard. I remember I was working New Year's because I, I'm not going out. I'm not doing anything. I decided to work New Year's for uh, so that like the people at our company could take time off and enjoy themselves. So I, I worked New Year's and I worked. I didn't take any break on Christmas or whatever. I just worked all that and it was dead. Like there's nothing. Right. Which I mean, it's a Christmas season. Right. But it was so dead. And then what happened like January 3rd? They killed uh, Soleimani. And then January 8th, they shot down uh, Ukraine flight. Ukrainian flight. Yeah. Right. And then things started getting wrapped out. And then what did we hear? COVID-19. Right. Like de December 31st, uh, the who found out about COVID-19, not through the not through China, but through a press release. And yeah. which we now know, we didn't know that at the time. And then we had the start of COVID-19. And so we had like the situation with China, then we have COVID-19, and then we had the protests, and then COVID-19. It's just been really 
like constant and i've never experienced mm. this sort of like it's really depressing because the thing is one of the reasons why i first moved back to canada and when i did was i felt really impotent in korea politically i can't do anything writing was kind of difficult and all that stuff so i went home i did that i came back here and now i feel impotent even though i am writing things that are informing people of stuff because nothing like not that i expect to change the world i'm I'm not i'm just writing my dinky little stories but it just feels i don't know it's quite oppressive you can't leave it i go home I mean, I work and I live at the same same place, so I I go from this room to that room, and it's just like, it's tough, you know. Like I write about masks and people dying, and then I come home and I fight with my daughter to get her to wear a mask when she won't wear one. So, it's just, <laughs> she will not wear one at all. And then the the fear, the the existential risk or existential fear of COVID nineteen is. Is kind of like the death terrors that we talked about before. Yeah. yeah. You know? And what, what we mean by death terrors if, from eons ago is that Brett and I suffer from this just instant, usually at night, where we just get, like, it feels like we got change wrapped around our chest about the impending death that's coming towards us. And it's just pulling tight. It's just a, <gasps> and It really is that. It's that breath, yeah, for sure. And... and yeah. It, I, I've gotten, I haven't had that for a while, but it's, it's come, it's happening again recently. And, um, and so like, we're thinking of going camping and there's this one beach near Halim, Gwakji. It's really nice, mm. for, especially for the oh, baby. Yeah. Okay. Cause it's flat and there's not a lot of waves and whatnot, but we can't go there now because of Halim is, uh, clusters in Halim, Halim, which is nearby. And so like, we're, we're questioning, wow. like, should we go? Should we go? Maybe. I don't know, we're outside, whatever, but you get it. You, like that's that existential fear. Mm-hmm. You know, like right. like you, you get a little tight. Lurks. Pardon? Don't go there. Death is there. Yeah. Like death is a physical being and it's mm-hmm. there. Mm-hmm. Then I can walk down the street and still get it. There's a wonderful little detail in Zorba the Greek, the novel mm-hmm. by Nikos Kazantzakis, I believe. And there's a, it takes place in the, on, a, on, a, on a remote Greek island. I believe it's the island of Crete, actually. Mm. And it's, it's sort of a, in those days in particular, it was, it was sort of like Jeju. You know, it's Greek, but it's also part something else. Mm. It's, the dialect is very strange. Mainland Greek people can get spotted immediately by how fair their skin and the skin is by comparison and how well they dress. Sort of the, the back end of Greece, even though it is gorgeous. Mm. So, um, there's a scene where uh, 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 a paranoid or, 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 a, or a lovesick sort of young Werther character kills himself. Mm-hmm. And the entire village is upset at this. And they, they find his body. They pull his body up from the coast. And there's no old women around. They're, they, they dress in clothing that resembles the bark of the trees. And they're just sitting by the trees watching this all go down and it's because they think if they disguise themselves as trees death won't see them you know death mm. won't be death 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 came for the boy right who mm. killed himself so death is physically in the area looking around mm. and if he sees an old woman he might go you know what shit that's right i have an appointment to reap her too i have to re you know what i'm saying so they they, they just kind of sit under against trees mm. wearing like brown dresses like the color of the bark so that they can camouflage themselves because death is around. Mm-hmm. Isn't that interesting? That's But that's kind of what you were just saying about Halim. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't want to walk to beach because death is over there. Yeah. The you know, it's not, even though it's over here too. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. everywhere. Yeah. Death is a strange kind of potential. It's a potential something. It's know? interesting to call it potential. It's inevitable, right? As we all know. I'm just, I mean, mm-hmm. my, my kid doesn't and I, fear the day that she has to learn that but yeah. it's uh it's interesting to call it a potential because it's yeah because it's potentially everywhere right it's potentially underneath every rock and every in every action yeah, yeah. um so i uh, 
Yeah. My phone made a strange noise when I was driving today. And I just didn't even think. I looked at it. Mm-hmm. And I was next, I look up and I'm in the other lane. Like that fast. Wow. And I was going about 45 miles an hour. And if there was another car mm-hmm. in that lane, I would have been hit head on and I would have been hurt very badly because I didn't have my seatbelt in. Mm-hmm. This is just today. My phone made a noise, a noise I didn't recognize. So I look at it, mm. I look back up like this, that fast, and I'm in the other lane. It's interesting. When it comes to fiction, things like that happen, and we don't believe it. I love I stuff know. like that when that happens in fiction. I mean, the road was curvy. That's how it happened. Right. Like, right. Yeah. But not not to take back, not to... In a book, we're like, oh, this is a contrived action. This is, yeah. this is you know, the plot is, is kind of showing too starkly, right? They're showing too noticeably. Mm. We'll see this, you know, but that's that was the one of the great criticisms of Shakespeare, isn't it? Shakespeare relied very heavily on on coincidence, happenstance meetings of it, people it, in in his dramas as well. Yeah, sure, sure. Tybalt any... recognizing Romeo at the party. Oh, well, okay, stuff, stuff like that. Yeah. Um. Um. Uh, I believe Hamlet. Hamlet. Snooping on the wrong person behind the curtain, thinking it was Claudius, and he it was actually Polonius. Own, yeah, yeah, he killed the he killed wrong guy Polonius. behind the curtains, right? Yeah, you know, just it relies heavily on happenstance, on misunderstanding, happenstance. Yeah, Romeo and Juliet, it, the 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 vials as well. Yes, right, absolutely. It's been a while since. Uh, have you read all Shakespeare? Some of Shakespeare? No, uh, no, I've, I've, no, I need to read. I actually bought. You know, beautiful gilt leaf. Mm. Like it looks like it belong and it belongs in Alfred Lord Tennyson's parlor. You know what I mean? Like it, it, it's a beautiful, expensive mm-hmm. leather. And I, I bought it mm. last year, and I, I need to mm. the complete work, like everything that's ever been attributed to him. Oh, like even his like and, sonnets and stuff. Yep, even his sonnets. Yep. So it's like it's 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 large enough to be a weapon. Mm. That was one of the uh, best classes I ever. T- I took a couple Shakespeare classes in university because I knew um, it's difficult to read him for like for pleasure on on your own, right? Because the language is a little bit and anar- like archaic and uh, it's it's difficult. Um, so I took a couple Shakespeare classes and so glad I did because he's it's just it's lovely. It's it true. Like I love his histories. You know, I, his metaphors. Oh, just his metaphors. Uh, no one, no one, mm-hmm. no one. Well, That's how many words think... did he invent? How many, how many no. expressions do we, do we, do we use by him now? Even you know? today, even today. Yeah. So, shall we mm-hmm. get into uh, boozing through the New Yorker? We shall. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I got yeah, my spiel. Pretty, sorry, we're we're mentioning you after Shakespeare. So, sorry, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> if you should ever listen to this podcast, which I doubt, you know, we're you're a tough act to follow. But you, this is a, this is a very short story. Mm. How about the, how about that Tracy, buddy? It's Here. the 1980s. You're a teenage East Berliner and bored and stuff, as a teenager would be in East Berlin under communism. Disaffected and bored, you are drawn like iron to a magnet to punks in the park and attempt to join their clique, which succeeds when you prove your hardness. By physically assaulting an annoying bloke with a with a hard on for a girl and an illegal punk concert, and she becomes the and you become the inept drummer of a three piece girl band, blah 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 Stasi's blah 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 surveillance blah 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 the wall falls, and those who are secretly working as undercover informants for the Ministry of State Security have to live with being outed by academics and journalists rifling through the communist files. The story, a transparent woman is about the effects of mass surveillance upon an individual and how it makes her hollow in mind and body, that she does not even own herself. Or as Orwell put it, nothing as your own, nothing is your own except a few cubic centimeters inside your skull. In this story that even may be true, but government, even in the story that may be true, but government control has made those few cubic centimeters empty. It is interesting, truly, I believe the world and the crumbling facade of once elaborate buildings and the husks of those with now, which are now being lived in. But I kept waiting for the story to actually begin, 
And when the story ended, I almost expected the words, the end, to materialize at the bottom of the page, and someone say, wasn't that nice? That was a nice little story. I tried to read all stories we talk about on the show at least twice. I only read this one once, as it didn't really need for a second reading, and I'll explain that why in the, when we get going. It's a story heavy in plot, thin on other elements that make up the so-called art form. On this episode of Boozing Through the New Yorker, little by little, she fell into a kind of magical thinking, as if reality of hat had happened to her depended on its being told. On this episode of being a boozing through the New Yorker, a transparent woman by Hart Kunzuro. I pronounced his name wrong. I'll get it right here. Uh, uh, typos, man. Typos. I wrote this actually late and I didn't proof it. Kick it. What did you think of the story? Uh, story? Mm. Well. Hari Kunzuro. Hari Kunzuro. Kunzuro, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, 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 again, I, I'm, when it comes to that dichotomy of show and tell, I always love a good tell. Mm. I love it when tell is done well. And this is, this is all about tell. This is, you know, there's hardly any characters are hardly quoted here. Mm. You hardly see what they, you know, it's, it's as if, it's as if we're being relentlessly led along by a Stasi agent, you know, oh, here's the, here's the point you should be paying attention to. You can pay attention to no other. Mm -hmm. Nothing feels, nothing feels indeliberate about it. It's very oppressive how it's written. I think that really fits. It's interesting that this young woman, Monica, the protagonist can, this is the East German system, right? Just, mm -hmm. okay, I don't, I, I got fired from this job. I'm just going to go here. This person has to hire me. So you have to be hired and you have to have a job mm -hmm. at all times. It's a very interesting, even though you might not be productive, even though you might not learn anything, even though your employer might be a Stasi informant, you, you still have to do it. You have to do it. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's just it's just how peripatetic her life is. She she lives in, what, no less than 21 places or something <laughs> like that at the time of the story? Just bouncing around both before and after mm -hmm. the wall falls. I felt, I think the author did a fairly good, me being a man and a 245-pound one at that, I, I you know, insofar as I can imagine what it's like to be a woman on her own, a young mm. woman on her own, you just felt the potential for rape everywhere in the story. It was very creepy. Mm -hmm. The Stasi agent obviously being, you know, roll neck, as he's called, who wears the turtleneck. He's the most obvious symbol of this, and he actually does, in effect, rape her at some point in the story. But the idea that you're, you're no matter what you're getting, you're getting fucked no matter what you're you're getting gaslit so brutally mm -hmm. by the apparatus of state that you you just cannot you can't say no to it it's like a rapist who stalks you mm -hmm. he's got he's got your every ingress and egress figured out he and you just, just lie there then you just say fuck it like what am i gonna do i either fight right. it or it's which is what she does. It's even in the worse end. than that. It's even worse than that. It's like it doesn't matter if you fight it. Yeah. You know, it just it doesn't. It's just fighting it is part of the plan. Mm -hmm. You fighting it is 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 part of the like wearing you out until you finally give in. Mm -hmm. Offer. It's even worse in this case. It's when you offer yourself mm -hmm. with the appearance of uh, with the appearance of volition. Mm -hmm. Like you're, you're fine. You're, you're like, okay, here. Mm -hmm. But of course, when she, when Monica cooperates with him, it's anything but volitional. It's all still coercion. Yeah. She, she that's what the transparent it, but, woman is. She's not a person anymore. Like right. that's what it really feels like. And she never becomes really a person again. Right. Yeah. You know, and she, it's, she never does. It's a, I, even I even my years later. After yeah. All falls. I didn't really. I, I, it sounds like I didn't like the story. I, I actually quite did. I found it really entertaining. And to 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 say that about such a horrible thing that happened, but it's it's so well done. It's very well researched, and I believed every second of it. 
right? Every like, second. Believed every second of it. Um, I I just felt like it was. It kind of felt like an elaborate treatment for a movie mm. because it was so much tell. And mm. I so I I was reading it and I just kept waiting for the story to, to, to start. It kind of felt like exposition. Mm-hmm. Right? And then right. it just ends and then you leave like, oh, that was nice. Mm. You know, I was never... And that was enjoyable. It's quite quite long compared to some of the other stories we read. And right. I read... And of course, I, I did a little bit of reading on it. It's adapted from a novel. Oh, And no Monica is telling her story to somebody. So oh, this is all her explaining her life to some, the book is called red pill and oh. it's about surveillance states. And it's some writer who American writer, who's doing something running around talking to people. And Monica tells her story to the writer, which I go, Oh, like I've, I read it first and I had those thoughts about it feeling like a treatment for a movie. And I would love to see this as a movie. And then I read that and I went, oh, that makes perfect sense. Like, why didn't they say that in the thing? Why did they do this at all? I I, kind of like this approach. It's because, Mm. you know, in in the novel, it sounds like Monica is actively telling her own story. Yeah. So in a way, she has power over that story. Mm. In this this rendition, it's told in the third person, Mm -hmm. right? And she doesn't get the chance to tell her own story. Right. Because she never actually does anything in the story. Mm-hmm. She's almost completely passive the entire time. Everything, even even her discovering punk mm-hmm. and slamming on a drum. I love the detail, too. Her pounding the drums sounded like dead bodies hitting the floor. The floor. Like yeah. It was just, it was just so bad. <laughs> like The instruments were bad. It was just passion. There was no mm-hmm. skill. That's a uh, really good point. The her action is getting her hair, cutting her head, head, cutting her head, cutting her hair, becoming a punk is almost like the only it's action she right has. Path of rapist, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So it's like everything she does is fated to slavery in a way. Mm-hmm. She doesn't she's not active at all in any positive sense in mm-hmm. the entire story? Even even after liberation, she's not. No, she just. Please. There's nothing to be liberated. Yeah. Yeah. There's nothing to be liberated. It's mm-hmm. it's it's just you know, she's almost a zombie. The living dead. Mm-hmm. And I, I think it's very interesting. Like you said though, the Orwellian metaf- the Orwellian uh, idiom there mm-hmm. that she does own her brain, it seems. She's 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 conscious. Mm-hmm. She's able to see it all. Maybe too late at times, but she is able to see it all. But mm. man, it, it, she's just trapped the entire, you know, the the Stasi, the East German police state, seeps into her the marrow of her being so much so that things are arguably worse for her after the wall falls. Mm. It's just she's just chaff in the breeze, going from city to city until they discover. That she was an informant, not knowing, not caring that uh, not every informant was voluntary. Not every informant volunteered, I should say. Mm. She was forced into it. She was outed as an informant without being one, which is, and she just gives up. It's really, it's it's good. It's it's really well done. It's a compelling story. I just. I, I, do you, am I? Do you like? Obviously, you don't feel the same way about it as I do, because I, I, I just felt like I could couldn't get into it as much. I felt like I was watching it, which is maybe part of the effect of like it's not necessarily a bad effect. I just couldn't connect to it or or feel it as much. I felt more observing than anything else. If that. But I, I'm curious, and the book doesn't, this sounds much more interesting than the actual book does, and the red pill. Like, I, I liked this story. I liked seeing this world because it was so real. Mm. You know, it was. That, 
the, the street corners and when she leaves Roll Neck and she's out on like just lost trying to like she's got to get somewhere but she really doesn't really have anywhere to be mm-hmm. except for the, the the husk of a building right. where the punks she live she has nowhere to be she has nothing to do mm. she, she has nobody mm. and it seems it seems as if when the trap is finally sprung, right, when they hustle her into the van with its compartments in the middle of the story, you just get the sinking feeling that literally everything she's done, breaking with her parents, mm-hmm. moving out of her house, uh, not having any not having any durable relationships, not having any real friendships, not having any any interest that falls within the parameters of legality Mm. within the law you know her only passion is to play musical instruments with the other two members of her band and be in that that punk rebellious energy but that's not an identity that's not a you can't like it's like alexei karamazov says god i'm quoting current brother karamazov Mm -hmm. twice today you know, you can't live, it's impossible to live in rebellion. Mm-hmm. You, know, you can't, you know, so it's just, and then when they finally spring a trap in her, there's no one to tell, she doesn't even think to tell anybody. She has nobody to go, she has nobody to give her life any meaning. It, it, just what do you do? The interesting what do thing, you do? the thing that I thought was kind of interesting about it was that, like, the punks weren't political. They were just no, they weren't. bored making Bored. shitty music like the lyrics are bad the lyrics weren't political either it was just angsty stuff yeah and they spent all this resources and time to what the stasi i mean spends all these resources and time to infiltrate this group to know to, to prevent from them from doing what they probably get right. older and realize this kind of sucks i don't want to live here anymore i'd rather live in the parent house my parents have and be one of those old like cabbage eating women who are in the window with the curtain spying on everybody else because that sounds a little more comfortable than this right which right. is probably what would have happened because they're just like they're teenagers which i right. thought was kind of an interesting thing to do as opposed to i don't know like it's not the intellectual groups that they're they're spying on no no there were none left uh, by that time you know, there were none left. I mean, apparently the official number is that when, when East Germany was finally liberated from from its enslavement behind the Iron Curtain, mm. it was discovered that about one in four East German adults were informants. It was an incredibly dense, deep... It was like, like you said, the Stasi were basically amusing themselves. Mm. They were so good at what they did. East Germany was so isolated, mm-hmm. and the Germans so efficient at bureaucracy in this twisted sense that they were just inventing problems to police. <laughs> and, you know, and, and for the joy, I mean, think of how much pleasure it must have given him and his team to gaslight Monica so cruelly. Mm-hmm. Like, all, every day she'd come home and fucking shit would be moved around in her apartment. They break into her apartment every fucking day. How much power they must have felt. Personal things to move around. Yeah, yeah, and they 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 got her punk records that there's no way they could have been in East. They had to have them smuggled in from West Germany, mm-hmm. you know. And they put them in her locker, so they had to pick her lock. You know, they had to they had to put them in her lock. You know, it, it's just they were just bored too. Yeah. And the only reason why they, well, the reason why they did that was to protect their real informant, Eric. Real informant, I think right? Who was Erica? an absolute self-righteous asshole. Uh-huh. There's a, there's if there's a second, if there's a secondary antagonist in the story, it's mm-hmm. her. Mm-hmm. You know, she's she's self-righteous. She's, you know, she's full of energy. Everything just comes very easily to her. Mm-hmm. She's one of these very magnetic, aggressive people. Charismatic, and probably hot, and probably pretty hot. Yeah, and she had it so easy because she was a very, she was very, very good at informing on other people. And probably the best part of the story is the is is after the at least what I liked a lot was seeing the world afterwards, and then, right. then that woman, that girl, becomes a politician, 
and right. uh, her roll neck sells flowers. She sees yeah, him some, some, some miserable flower vendor. Yeah, yeah. I, I thought that yeah. was great to see. You know, he's not arrested or anything. Um, no. We for well, we, as long as he keeps his head down. Yeah, as long as he, as long as he, you know, hides under a hat bill, you know, in a market. If he ever tried to get a real job, they'd find him out immediately when they did a background check. It's and they'd pathetic. fucking put his ass in jail where he belongs. I almost felt yeah. like when she she sees him on the street, Monica, and she flees pretty much because she doesn't like all, you wouldn't want to see him. But it almost seems like she's fleeing in a sense because of how pathetic he is, and that affects. Mm. Like it's he's not a powerful man, and he never really was. And she allowed herself allowed herself. She didn't have a choice but to to be manipulated by him. To, right. to that degree, and he's just a fucking fat flower seller. Flower merchant. And that was, you know, interestingly enough, she, in a way, she didn't have to talk to him because seeing mm. him in that position where he was quite obviously not in any position of power over anyone mm. is like, oh, she's like, oh my God, it's finally over. Yeah, oh, oh interesting. Yeah, so it's just so, so they're not putting images of a wall coming down on my television like this is real like this is that's that's how badly she had been psychologically tortured by this guy mm -hmm. and she thought the fucking liberation was another stasi plot that's to, that was to, a great point too right how many people thought that how many people thought that a, was it a fucking month before the wall fell she finally decided to go to an, another town mm -hmm. <laughs> she's like i like it you know, um, and of course the the uh, the real informant mm -hmm. was uh, outed. She got really fat, <laughs> and she said she didn't regret anything. And then she kills herself. Mm. The end. Which I don't. Know, I, I thought it was rather shitty story. To, uh, shitty. I shouldn't use that word. I, I I didn't understand the the choice to end the story with the informant and not Monica. You're right. I don't quite understand why that happened, but depending on what it is, it has to do with the, the novel too, right? But you, that's a good point. Why is she the one that gets the last word? Yeah. Like, are we supposed to feel sympathetic for her? Because that's kind of what it feels like, right? Like, oh, like she's sad. Oh. Well, in the same way that that you know the the narrative tech the, the technique used to end the Sopranos, for instance, was the focus of the story ceases to grow mm. there's no more growth there's no more so tony gets shot well mm. i shouldn't say so it's not causal but anyway tony is the subject of the sopranos he is the 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 figure around which everything turns mm. and when he's finally killed just before he's killed everything stops just cuts the black because the story can't live anymore without Tony being alive in a way the whole he carried everything mm -hmm. story the story's whole job was to tell his story with the mm -hmm. story over the story's literally over right maybe when we see Monica catch sight of the Stasi the brute who ruins her life mm -hmm. as a flower vendor she feels relief. She feels it's finally over. I can finally move on. Mm -hmm. But immediately she's oppressed by knowing that her former bandmate is, an inf is the real informant. Mm -hmm. So now the dramatic tension is ratched up even higher than it was before. But nothing so really maybe, happens with that. Maybe, though, mm -hmm. maybe when this old friend dies maybe the story of Monica's trauma dies with it. Maybe she becomes a different person. And that's a different story to tell. Mm -hmm. So that one ends. The story of her in hell is the, is the, is the, is the, is the plot of Transparent Woman. But maybe her journey into her proper life mm -hmm. begins with another story at the moment that this friend dies and the relief that she gets. But uh, that it's over. did we get? I don't know. Uh, but we don't 
necessarily know if she feels relief at the end. I don't think that is a pattern. I think she would. Right, but because it's not I, the clear. Only, I think she would if only because she feels relief when she sees, when she knows that her psychological torment is over oh, at the hands okay. of the Stasi guy, mm -hmm. but she's immediately oppressed once more mm -hmm. with this, another antagonist shows up on the scene who mm -hmm. was her comrade bandmate. So when flat that's mate. resolved, yeah. flat, right. At one time, closest confidant. Mm -hmm. So maybe the story ends abruptly mm -hmm. when the source of this, if you were, er conflict, this, this even greater, like a sense of betrayal and disorientation mm -hmm. that comes along with learning that you were, she was not even conscripted to do honest work for the Stasi. <laughs> she was conscripted to cover, to do dishonest work for the Stasi so she could cover for the actual informant who was getting sniffed out. <laughs> Jesus. Talk about, you know, you know, it's like you're a, you're a body double for a dictator and, you know. You're not even the you're, number one body you're, double. You're not even the number one body double. You just <laughs> killed, you know, you're, you're a body double that died in a bus crash rather than an assassination <laughs> attempt. You know what I mean? Like, it's just so crazy. It's just, it's uh, just nuts. It's like you're the body double of a body double. Right, yeah. You know, you're not even, you know, even like, what the fuck? What did I give my life up for? You're a decoy. To look you're the like de this guy? You're the decoy of a decoy. <laughs> A decoy, yeah. you know. So it's it's may, maybe that's why the story ends abruptly. That mm -hmm. particular story is quite literally over. Mm -hmm. That that part of Monica's life, mm -hmm. that 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 which began with her leaving her parents' house and leaving herself exposed to the corrosive mm -hmm. of East German society, mm -hmm. without guidance, without the guidance of her forefathers, as it were. Mm -hmm. When she's just out there shaving her head. And, you know, pissing in fountains or whatever the hell she was doing. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. it's it's you know that story ends when her her former friend kills herself. Brett, I don't know. Do you know what we forgot to do? We forgot oh, to, oh, the pose. The pose, man. The pose. <laughs> so so since we are ending the podcast, we will end with the pose. pose. But yeah. I'm Daryl. He's Brett. We're boozing. Keep scribbling. Now pose. Make a point. Make a point. <laughs> Signing off this week. Boozing too late. Fuck it. <laughs> <laughs>